Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. I'm sure we're going to make it worth your while as we discuss this exciting new technology that's revolutionizing our fields. And we'll discuss both the science and the ethics of CRISPR technology with our expert panel. Just a show of hands, how many people were at the science part last night? Any? There were some, about a quarter. Um, so we'll go through the basic biology um, to describe it as well as some of the, um, the newer translational biology attempts to use this to correct genes in various organisms. And um, I think this is an incredibly powerful technology and with great power comes responsibility and in some cases a little bit of danger. And I think these are all important issues to discuss and that's what we're here to do today. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce our expert panel. Our first guest is a molecular biologist and passionate advocate of citizen science. In 2009, she co-founded GenSpace NYC, the world's first community biotechnology laboratory. In 2011, GenSpace's groundbreaking programs were awarded the prize for best social study in synthetic biology at SB 5.0, which is the leading international synthetic biology conference. Please welcome Ellen Jorgensen. Also with us tonight is postdoctoral research associate at the Rockefeller University. He has adapted genome editing techniques, including CRISPR, to investigate the genes and the neural circuits that control behaviors in mosquitoes that carry diseases such as dengue and Zika virus. Please welcome Ben Matthews. Our next participant is a core faculty member and assistant investigator at the New York Genome Center and an assistant professor at the Department of Biology and the Center for Genomics and Systems Biology at NYU. He's a bioengineer creating new tools to understand the impact of genetic changes on the nervous system and cancer evolution. He's a recipient of the NIH Pathway to Independence Award and is a next generation leader for the Paul Allen Institute for Brain Science. Please welcome Neville Sanjana. Neville? Also joining us is an associate professor of law and affiliated faculty at the Innovation Center for Law and Technology at New York Law School. His focus is on how scientific developments affect patent law and litigation. He was also a fellow at the Center for Law and Biosciences at Stanford Law School and a patent litigator at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher in New York. Please welcome Jacob Shirkow. And last but not least, our final guest today is director of the International Referral Center for Inherited Retinal Degeneration. He has been working with embryonic stem cells since 1992. And in 1995, he created the first mouse model for a recessive form of retinitis pigmentosa by applying genome engineering to ESL technology. He has co-authored 147 peer-reviewed publications and is the editor of a book on the uses of genome engineering in the field of stem cell research. Please say hello to Stephen Sang. Okay, so let's begin our discussion at the very beginning. Uh, CRISPR, as some of you may know, is actually an ancient immune system that was developed in bacteria to protect, to protect against their main predators, which are viruses. And we have been able to harness that into a powerful gene editing technology. Ellen, can you uh, walk us through the story of how CRISPR was first discovered and how we decided to use it for editing genomes? Well, actually, the first mention of it was way back in 87. And it was a Japanese scientist who was sequencing an E. coli gene. And at the very, very end of his paper, there was a little note saying, well, I saw these weird little repeats when I was doing the sequencing. I have no idea what they are. And uh, we were talking about it. You look at that, and you kind of get chills because you realize what was happening and the trajectory that it was going to follow when you see something like that. And then it really is a story that covers uh, several continents. Um, a lot of the early work was done in Europe um, by a scientist named Mojica, who was studying archaea in a very salty bay near where his research institute was. And he noticed these things. And he ended up compiling uh, many, many sequences of single-celled organisms and finding these repeats in all of them. And when you see something happening over and over and over again in nature, you start to think, well, maybe there's something important about this. And he was actually the first to propose that it was a bacterial immune system. So then uh, people started uh, dissecting it. 
And it turned out that um, there were three different types of CRISP CRISPR systems. The one we ended up hijacking is the simplest. And um, uh, it takes uh, a certain amount of um, uh, energy, some proteins, to, um, to go through the motions of uh, taking pieces of DNA from invading uh, bacteriophages, uh, plasmids, um, anything that would threaten the life of the bacterium, and insert it between these little repeat regions. And that's the targeting part of CRISPR in, in the wild. So that, that system um, ends up making two separate RNA molecules that are then processed, which takes more proteins, and um, end up coming together and then uh, attaching to the Cas9 protein, which is the one that does the actual cutting of the genome, as we saw in the movie. So uh, there, there's a couple of different components to the system, and it can be fairly complicated. However, if you just artificially make this targeting RNA, you don't need any of those enzymes. All you need is essentially, if you think of it as a guided missile, the Cas9 is the warhead and the guide RNA is the targeting system. And if you make it artificially, uh, you, you don't have the need for all of that, that other machinery. And it becomes very, very, very simple. You need one gene to make the Cas9 and one um, translational unit to make the guide RNA. And voila, you've got the, the whole thing in one package. Great. Can you say a little bit about how the protein and the guide RNA are delivered in, in various systems? What types of vehicles do we use to get the, introduce the Well, cells? see, that, that's the thing is, it, you know, it's, it's a great system, but the devil is always in the details. So if you're going to modify something like yeast, which is a unicellular organism, and, and there are many, many ways to coax yeast to take up DNA, you can put these two things on a loop of DNA called a plasmid, put them into the yeast, and the yeast machinery will transcribe and, and make the Cas protein and make the guide RNA, and you're off to the races. Mm -hmm. It gets a little more difficult if you start talking about higher cells. If you've got them in a Petri dish, you can do the same sort of thing. There are systems, if any of you are doing that sort of stuff in, in your labs, you know, you can transfect with lipofectamine, you can do uh, various different ways of getting this plasmid into the cell. Uh, the difficulty comes if you're trying to now do it to either a germline, mm -hmm. so an embryo, or uh, <coughs> trying to create, say, a genetic defect in a fully grown person or animal, mm -hmm. because then you have to actually get the CRISPR into the target cells. Right. And I think there's some people here who are going to talk about the places in the body that are easily targeted mm -hmm. at, this, at, the, at this time. At the same time, people are building mice that express this enzyme in all tissues, mm -hmm. right? So they could potentially deliver the guide and have a, an alteration in whatever tissue they want as a, as a model for looking at the consequences. I think that's, that's fair. That's always a little dicey, if you'll uh, <laughs> pardon uh, the pun. I like the word. Be because uh, the system isn't perfect yet. Correct. And so if you've got it on all the time, there's a low level of off-target stuff. So. We will talk a lot about <laughs> off-target. That's a, a very important point. But I'll, I'll open this question to all of you. I mean, are, are you surprised how quickly this has sort of revolutionized the field? I mean, after all, there were other gene editing technologies around, yet this has captured the imagination of scientists <laughs> so rapidly and is being implemented so rapidly. Can you, some of you describe why you think that might be? Why is that happening? I, ben? I can jump in real quick. So I work on uh, a mosquito, Aedes aegypti, which is sort of a non-traditional genetic model organism, which just means that up until five or ten years ago, we did not have tools available to easily edit its genome, and so we would turn to other insects to model the traits that we were interested in studying. And I went to a meeting um, at which people were discussing how to use some of the first generation of genome editing tools, like zinc fingers and talons. And between the time that they announced the meeting and the time that the meeting actually happened, there were about three or four papers that came out uh, on, on this new kit on the block, this, this CRISPR uh, toolkit. And I remember going to this meeting, and they completely reshuffled the schedule. They invited all of these new speakers. And everybody I talked to who had done it in cells said, it's too easy for you not to try. And I think that was really the, the leap for me, was that zinc fingers and talons were great, except they relied on engineering a protein for every specific gene that you wanted to target. And to do that 
involved either a lot of labor or a lot of money and a lot of time to outsource that to other people. And this involves one single gene, as Ellen said, and then an RNA molecule which we can make in the lab in you know, hours rather than days, weeks, months. And so it truly was too easy not to try. And so we tried it and it, and it basically worked first time. So I think speaking as somebody who is applying these tools after our colleagues have developed them in, in systems where you can do this much more quickly, uh, it, the ease and the efficiency of it was, was the big right. driver for us. Simplicity. And then also yep. this issue of it working in essentially every organism that's been tried. It's amazing. Which, is, which yeah. is quite remarkable. Yes, you want to jump in? So come to our talk about uh, the clinical use in humans just a little bit later. But it's for research use in my lab to, to generate knockout mice. It used to take at least nine months and you to pray that your embryonic stem cell can become a sperm, go germline. Just to say what a knockout mouse is, just in case some people don't know. So we had to do tissue culture to, to, uh, to generate the mutations in one of the uh, two chromosomes of a gene. And then uh, we hope that this embryonic stem cell can become essentially a sperm and they can pass the mutation on to in the germline. The germline means uh, either uh, oocyte or sperm in the germline. But then, the, so it, for the stem cell to become a sperm, that takes about uh, the whole process of making chimeras and all this takes about like nine months. And there's a lot of, th when I was a graduate student, a lot of things can go wrong in, in between <laughs> that your, your cell will just not become a, uh, will not become a sperm. But with CRISPR, uh, you can, on Monday, you can design your guide. And then on Wednesday, you can inject the oocyte. But now, you can, because you, can, you do not need to use embryonic stem cells for some of the manipulations. So in three weeks, instead of, uh, and you can multiplex. So there's no, I mean, it has been shown that you can do seven knockouts in the same mouse. You can do, there's no reason you cannot do 15 or, or 30 in the same, same oocyte. And, and then, uh, and, and you can, so, so by Wednesday, you inject the oocyte. In three weeks, you have your knockout mice already, as opposed to nine months. Right. So they had really had, uh, now you can do multiplex, uh, complex trade to look at, different genes interacting in the same, same mouse as opposed to we do one gene at a time, taking nine months to knock out one gene. Right. So I think that brings up an important point, which is that much of the conversation has revolved around treating disease and uh, ultimately per perhaps editing genes in human embryos, which is a very controversial point, which we'll, we'll come to. But many researchers are saying <laughs> that the real revolution is at the bench and that we can learn <coughs> things that we very rapidly from model systems, model organisms, that will teach us about disease and disease processes that ultimately will lead to drugs, as opposed to using this editing technology to correct a genetic defect, which has, which has its difficulties. Um, so let's spend a little bit of time. Maybe each of us can describe the significant ways science, scientists are using CRISPR at the bench. We've talked about some means. You want to add a little bit more, Neville, to? Uh, sure, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about what I've done. So. Um, I just want to echo the point that, that you made, which is that really the quantum leap forward in my mind with, with uh, CRISPR and CRISPR proteins like Cas9 is that genome engineers, like when I started my postdoc, uh, postdoctoral work in a bioengineering lab about five years ago, I was using one of those previous generations of genome engineering technologies that you mentioned, uh, tail nucleases, which come from plants, uh, or sorry, from plant pathogens. And so with these, there's a long history actually of genetic modeling for science for using um, uh, model organisms like mice to model human diseases to get some, some insight into these diseases. And um, really in the last 20 years that we've had programmable nucleases, um, of which CRISPR is one kind of programmable nuclease, it's always been kind of out of the grasp of most biological scientists to use these tools easily. And the reason is that just what you said, pro making proteins. Protein engineering is hard. So imagine the genome, which like the human genome is three billion base <laughs> pairs long. So every time you need to target a different region of the genome, you need to build a new protein. And that, um, you know, you can just take my word for it that at the bench when you do this, <laughs> Uh, especially with the programmable uh, nucleases like zinc fingers or talons, is, is quite difficult. These repetitive protein domains and rearranging them is, is just not um, super easy. The quantum leap forward with CRISPR-Cas9 is that the, the nuclease component, Cas9, is actually generic, the, um, the thing that actually comes onto the DNA and cuts it. And it's guided to a specific location in that big genome by a small uh, piece of DNA or RNA. And one technology that we have really 
um, well, well done in our labs. Actually, we don't even do it in our labs. We just send it out to a company, and the next day it just it arrives in a tube. It's mm. overnight. Uh, you can get these, these reagents that can take that generic Cas9 nuclease and move it around. So, so that's really, I think, the, if you, you know, take away one thing, it's that compared, this, you know, this field of genome engineering has actually existed for a long time. The real difference is it just got a whole lot easier in the last few years with this um, CRISPR, uh, with the CRISPR systems. And so I'll give like the briefest bit of what, what, what I do um, uh, with, with CRISPR. And so one, one of the, there's, as you'll, I think, hear from, these, from folks here, there's many, many things that are possible with, with genome engineering tools. Uh, one of the things that I'm very excited about is um, because it's so easy to build these little DNA guides, um, something that I and others uh, in, in the lab, I came from in Feng Zhang's lab and in my lab now at uh, the New York Genome Center and NYU, is we're developing large libraries of thousands uh, to hundreds of thousands of CRISPR reagents to target many different places in the genome. And so the kinds of questions that we can ask when we can easily build genome engineering reagents are just a different scale of questions. So one of the first things we did is we took um, melanoma cells. So, you know, there's people get uh, skin cancers, which are called uh, melanomas. And in, uh, when these, these, uh, these skin cancers are treated with certain drugs, often what happens, what's observed in the clinic, is that there's uh, resistance to the drug. And so what, what we did is we took um, a library of CRISPR reagents that can knock out every gene in the human genome, and we, we basically said, what specific gene mutations of all the genes in the genome, this kind of question you couldn't ask before, of all the genes in the genome, what specific genetic mutations could lead to resistance to this drug, which was called vemurafenib? It was approved in 2011 by the FDA for uh, melanoma. And so, um, and what, you know, because people have been observing this, this resistance uh, to vemurafenib in the clinic, it was really helpful to try and get this overall view. Instead of collecting all these patients, you know, maybe hundreds of patients, to try and, and then sequencing to see, okay, what, how, how did their tumor evolve to get resistance to the drug? Here we could try and prospectively predict this. So, so that's just kind of one thing you can do when it's easier to do genome engineering than with those previous things like zinc fingers and tails where making new proteins is really hard. Right. That was a very long answer to no, no, no. a simple question. <laughs> but, a great, but a great answer. Um, I think delivery systems are evolving as well. Um, in my laboratory, we actually use adenovirus to deliver CRISPR, the, the protein, as well as the guide RNA. And we can put this into accessible organs. So one thing, adenovirus causes a common cold, is a derivative of a common cold virus, and um, can actually be used in to uh, insert genes or to uh, manipulate genes in the lungs of mice if you have them inhale this adenovirus. So we could look at potential causes of lung cancer, for example. And was, as Kate mentioned, we also use it in the brain. We can actually inject these viruses into the brains of mice and ask whether or not certain genetic lesions that we see in humans can actually cause or drive brain cancer in, 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 the, mo in the model system. So yeah. I think these are important. Yeah, Stephen, so, do you So there's one more use, uh, say, in, uh, in medical genetics. Uh, we frequently see patients, and now they with the next generation sequencing technology, the most common uh, result they, you send from uh, the sequencing patient is variant of unknown significance of some <laughs> uh, new gene. So before we cannot validate whether or not this new gene uh, or even a list of genes, you get a, a file of uh, 10 candidates from, from uh, frequently we see patients, they only maybe it's a uh, private mutation in that family or a private mutation that has not been described before. Mm -hmm. But now with the CRISPR cas of the ESA system, either you can test, get functional test validation of this variant of known significance to turn them into significant if you have a functional assay, either in, <coughs> in uh, patient cell lines or, or, or in, uh, in, uh, in, in mice. Mm -hmm. So before we're taking nine months to, make a, to do a knock in mouse, it's not very practical, but three weeks is practical. Right. Sometimes you can make them either in mice and patient cell line to get a functional assay. Speed. Ben, you want to say a few words about uh, how you're using CRISPR technology in the mosquito? To, uh... Sure, absolutely. So I think we'll talk a little bit later about something that's been in the news, uh, which is called Gene Drive. So we'll save that. But what we mostly do, and I work in Leslie Vossel's lab at the Rockefeller University, and she's been interested in the smell of, uh, or the taste and smell systems of insects for, for uh, the majority of her career. And so I joined the lab and became interested in the um, sense of taste and smell in the mosquito Aedes aegypti. And so this is the, what we think is the primary vector of Zika virus, as well as chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, 
um, and other arboviruses in that camp. Um, and so what we do is we take the ease uh, of these new generation of genome editing tools and we're kind of working our way systematically through different gene families that we think are involved in um, the mosquito's ability to target humans uh, because these mosquitoes are very anthropophilic, which means uh, if you're at a zoo, these mosquitoes will bite you over every other warm-blooded uh, animal in that zoo. This is just what they've done, and they know that we are an easy source of, of protein. And the female mosquito takes a blood meal in order to develop eggs, so this is a critical component of their life cycle. So evolution has acted on their chemosensory systems uh, to make them extremely good um, at identifying and biting human beings. And so, just to back up, what we're doing is we're now moving beyond uh, a scenario where we could target one or two or three genes uh, in order to ask questions about what the genetic pathways are that control taste and smell. And now, for example, I can mutate 10 or 12 or 15, uh, and ultimately we're, we're going to go much higher than that. And so what we do is we make stable genetic uh, <coughs> mutants, so the equivalent of a knockout mouse, we make a knockout mosquito. Um, and then we test them in uh, very sensitive behavioral assays to see whether or not um, they have any deficits uh, in their ability to, to find and target human beings. Um, and so that's kind of the, the very basic uh, application of CRISPR, which is just to delete a gene or inactivate a gene. Um, but the other thing that I'm really excited about now is we're actually using it to insert new DNA into the genome of the mosquito. And if we do this in the right place, so if we do it uh, at a location in the genome where a gene uh, that is uh, expressed in their olfactory system uh, sits, then we can actually use the uh, <laughs> regulatory elements of that gene to now express <coughs> proteins uh, in the cells that that uh, endogenous gene would normally be expressed in. And we can control neural circuits through light, for example, or through temperature. And then we can ask questions that go beyond just pure genetic lesions and say, are these particular sets of brain cells, these neurons, are they involved in the mosquito's um, kind of behavioral output in response to human odors? So the ease, I'm, I'm just going to echo what we'll probably say this all afternoon, <laughs> but it really is the ease of, of this system that lets us take these experiments, which we've thought about for a long time, and our colleagues who work in organisms like the fruit fly have been doing for a long time, and I used to work in the fruit fly, and they're not that interesting in terms of their behavior. Um, <laughs> and if you're interested in something like disease transmission, you know, I'm Someone just Someone might take honest. issue with that, but then... Yeah. <laughs> I, I love fruit flies, I do, but if you're interested in the transmission of an arbovirus like Zika virus, you, you cannot model that in a fruit fly. And so now we're taking these classes of experiments that, um, that we could only dream of five or 10 years ago, and now we're actually starting to implement the, the reagents that we need to, to ask those questions. Thank you, Ben. So Jake, I want to bring you in on the <laughs> ethics, but before, I, but before I do, I want to introduce the concept of manipulating the human genome. So that's obviously a very um, important point to discuss. Do we want to do that? Um, how do we want to do it? Uh, I think there are two general categories. One is manipulating the genome of, let's say, a patient who has a genetic uh, abnormality, and we want to mutate and we want to change the, the genetics of a particular cell type within that person, versus the idea of manipulating the human germline, where we introduce a change into a very early embryo, and that person will carry that change throughout their life as well as pass it on to their progeny. Okay, so those are two very different categories of, of human genetic manipulation. And there are potential problems with both. Um, does anybody want to tackle the question of what the problems might be in doing that, let's say, first in the somatic cell and then ultimately in the germline? Well, I mean, as you know, they're technical problems, first of all. So uh, the second half of the CRISPR story is that what this, this guided missile does is it makes a double-strand break in DNA. And that can be catastrophic for a cell, so there's all sorts of mechanisms to fix this. And there are two major pathways, and they both can make mistakes. Um, one just joins the two broken ends together and sometimes deletes a letter or adds a letter, uh, and that usually messes up the gene where it happens. And then the other one goes, oh my god, there's a break here. Is there anything else I can use to fix it that looks kind of like this? And it uses a homologous piece of DNA and literally copies it. And so if you use that second pathway, what you have to do along with the CRISPR 
is put in another piece of DNA that's like a Trojan horse. The two ends of it have DNA similar to where you make the break, and then you can put whatever you want in the middle. And there are size limitations to that, but um, th there's no limitation as to what that thing in the middle might be. And these two pathways operate in cells, and some types of cells like one pathway better than the other. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you can't control that. Because the one you, you want is the Trojan horse one, because okay. then you could do just about anything. So there's that. And then there's also, as you said, this, this, this percentage. Right now, there's a tremendous amount of work going into making the system uh, more accurate and also uh, bringing our level of sensitivity to seeing um, if you can detect uh, an off-target effect. So by off-target, Ellen means changes that happen at some place other than the, the intended target. And the consequences of that change we don't know necessarily. We don't know where else it's the, the change is being made. What are the long-term consequences of that? So Jake, who do you think should be, <laughs> I know it's a tough question, but who should be responsible for deciding when it's okay to try to introduce these changes? Let's say, first, let's stick with somatic cells, just in our body as opposed to the germline. Should the scientists be making the decisions? Are there ethical considerations that others need to need to be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially what's happening now. I mean, you know, we have various regulatory layers in place to ensure that to the extent we're doing experiments on humans, that we're doing them in the most ethically responsible way. We have institutional review boards uh, that are, you know, these are boards typically of scientists at any given institution that review whether or not professors who are doing this kind of work are, again, kind of doing them in ethically appropriate ways. Um, we have several regulatory <laughs> agencies in the United States, such as, for example, the Food and Drug Administration, National Institute of Health, that kind of also take a look at this to ensure that if you're either receiving federal funding to do some of this work, or if you want to uh, try to uh, push a drug or push a therapy through clinical trials because you want to um, be able to sell that, um, that you're, that you're not only doing it in a way that appears to be uh, therapeutically effective, but you're doing it in a way that ensures that um, it's kind of being done with the, with the highest sense of ethics in mind. Thus far, the system has worked, I would say, extraordinarily well. That's not to say that there haven't been lapses, and there haven't been some pretty critical lapses where people have died. Um, but if you look at all of the clinical trials that are being conducted with kind of all of the work, including gene therapy work that has been, you know, that has been done over the past you know, years, um, 20, 30, 40 years, um, the, the vast majority of these cases go forward without any incident. So I think kind of with that in mind, I think the perfect's the enemy of the good. I don't necessarily think that we should kind of, kind of uproot the entire system of regulatory approval that we have just because CRISPR is really easy <laughs> to use, just because it's really powerful, just because it seems to be effective. Um, I think that the system that we have of ethical review, if you want to think of it that way, it has worked well thus far. And until there is some evidence or kind of some model to suggest that for whatever reason that's not going to work here, I don't necessarily think we should reinvent the wheel. Can I jump in for sure. a second? Please. If you notice, the two things that you mentioned were selling and government funding. So there is no law in the United States against engineering human embryos. You cannot use NIH funding without review to engineer human embryos. But there's certain countries it's banned, like yeah. Canada. It's yeah. not banned yeah. in the US. Right. So the control in the US what, is what, all around the money. What type of engineering money. are you talking about in terms of? Germline the, engineering. Germline engineering of a human embryo. Of a human embryo is not illegal in the United States. It's, <coughs> it's, you can't use government funding to do it. It's like the stem cell story. At one point, you couldn't use uh, anything except a very small number of stem cell lines. Mm -hmm. uh, but the state of California set up its own fund. And because there was no law against it in California or in the United States, but the funding was, was cut off to everyone because of the laws. The, the, the other thing is, um, is, is the idea of selling. So if you're not selling anything, <laughs> then you don't, the FDA doesn't interact with you. I mean, the FDA, they, their mandate is that if someone tries to put a product and get it approved for use, that it's safe. But if you're not trying to make a product, 
I mean, I just came back from a two-day meeting at the National Academy of Sciences around this, but you know, it's famous that a lot of the things around engineering plants are slipping through the regulations. Mm. So it, it's yeah. interesting that, that human embryos, well, in Europe and Canada, it's, out, it's outlawed without permission from the government here. But let's be not. clear. I mean, nobody's using CRISPR yet to modify a human embryo. Uh, or, or a That we know of. That we know of, and I, well, wait well, a minute. Very, wait, someone in the thick, UK is well, doing research, okay. and they are the first person to get in November, I think it was of this year, or maybe even later, and, uh, a researcher in the UK got permission to to engineer early stage human embryos. And this this brings us to a very important ethical consideration, because in my mind, there's a very thick line drawn in the sand that we have to discuss, and it was discussed a little bit last night. Uh, Jennifer Doudna, who you saw, who was one of the early adopters, one of the early inventors of, of CRISPR, has said that one of her greatest nightmares is to wake up one day and find out some CRISPR baby, some embryo that had been modified with CRISPR, was born. And she would be very disturbed by that. And George Church, on the other hand, felt, well, you know, <laughs> we've been through this before. You know, people were afraid of in vitro fertilization, and they were worried what would happen with those children, and that turned out to be perfectly fine. Well, I think there, it's a different order of magnitude, actually, because even if that CRISPR baby is born, it might look perfectly fine when it's a day or two old, but who knows what's going to happen 10 years from now, right? And how do we ever do that first child? I mean, I think that's an ethical consideration that people really have Why to Why is that different from test tube babies? Well, because I think manipulating the genome is very different in my mind than putting together a healthy sperm with a healthy egg and then developing Yes, there were potentially inherent risks, but it seems to me inherently safer than manipulating a piece of the genome. The long-term consequences of which, yes, we know the effect, even if you can get rid of all of the off-target effects, how do we know that that specific change won't have long-term consequences in the human that we cannot model what if in you're another just, organism? What if you're just bringing back one base pair, like a sickle cell case or something. Do you know, can you say unequivocally that that won't affect chromosome dynamics 20 years from now in some cell type? Well, we know what it is in normal people, and if you just bring it back to what it is in people that don't have the disease. Right, but potential off-target effects then still become, still become an issue. Yes, they do. And we can do that, so the question becomes, should we do that with CRISPR, or should we do it by screening embryos for, for the correct, right, for, uh, for an embryo that has you know, all the correct alleles, assuming it's a recessive mutation in the parent, that the parents have, uh, couldn't possibly contribute to uh, a mutant phenotype. Do we do that or do we do CRISPR? I think that's a, an important consideration. Anybody else want to jump in here and... Yeah, I mean, so I... I <laughs> right. I put so, you on the spot. Sure, sure. So, so I, I suppose the kind of weight of ethics falls on me. Um, fine. Uh, uh, great. Uh, the lawyer. Yeah, I mean, I mean so... so you know, look, um, the technical concerns, I think, are serious. And when we're talking about risks, um, I think one of the things to think about is that even if it is true, and it is likely true, that the risks are small, the harm, the potential harm, is great. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that I agree with the notion that, well, you know, IVF, totally fine and normal, and it was fine that when we tried it the first time back in the 1970s, but, oh man, CRISPR edited humans, that's, you know, at a kind of order of magnitude separate. Again, these are instances in which the risk profile may be different, but the harms are still, the, the potential harms, I should rather say, are still pretty substantial. I, I think that we are, I hate to use this word, we are lucky that IVF has worked out with such grandeur the way that it has to the point where there's a substantial fraction of the population that has been born through IVF. In fact, looking out at this room and kind of sadly uh, needing to exclude anybody who's roughly over 45 or so, um, you know, assuming that we have more than, uh, you know, let's say 30 to 50 of young people out here, one of you is statistically likely to have been born through the IVF process. Mm. Um, at least here in the United, United States. We're, we're lucky that that has worked. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, to the extent that someone is going to engage in CRISPR-edited humans, and, and to be clear, I, I think that A, you're ethically crazy to try, and B, somebody is going to try, and I will, you know, I will, I will take bets with anybody in the audience that it is mm. going to happen soon. Um, just because, again, it is so easy, and there are scientists out there whose, I'm not sure how else to put this, whose ethical bar is lower than your median scientist in the United States. 
Um, so it's kind of, uh, you know, that is, going to, that is going to happen. So, I mean, I think it is incingent upon scientists here in the United States to be the people who are the vanguard, um, you, you know, saying that the risks are high, um, or the potential risks are high, and, uh, you know, therefore this is something that we should, you know, think about before we engage in. So, yeah. So that's one of the potential dangers. Any other potential dangers? People think of terrorism as a... As a, as a possibility. Does anybody think of that as a realistic possibility, using CRISPR as a terrorist weapon? I know it's been in the news. I think it's unlikely, but anybody? In, are you talking not in humans? We're releasing a virus that would modulate um, genes of whoever is infected. Is that an unlikely scenario? Not something we need to worry about? It's, it's no difference from 30 years ago when, when recombinant DNA comes around, right? Right. So there was a big discussion of recombinant DNA. People were worried about that. And scientists actually called their own moratorium on that research. They're not doing that today, right? There's no moratorium as far as I know. Obviously, in manipulating the uh, human embryos, yes, there's essentially an ethical moratorium, but it's still possible to do. Well, there was um, a big meeting earlier this year yeah. where a lot of people, actually some people from the original <coughs> Silomar conference weighed in at that meeting and, and was, said it was very the, similar. And how did the discussion go? I mean, Well, they, they came out with a, an actual um, set of, of guidelines from that meeting, so. Do you want to outline what some of those were? Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know in <laughs> I don't know in detail. Okay. I, I mean, obviously, we, we need to start talking about gene drives if we're talking about doomsday, doomsday scenarios. That brings us to Ben. Ben, tell us about gene drive. Our doomsday guy. My, yeah, Our gene drive happy, guy. Happy to help. Um, so gene drive, you may have heard about. And just to be clear, this is not something that we personally do in our lab, but it's, <laughs> but it's a class. That you know of. Uh, well, sure. Yeah, maybe I have uh, you know, one of my graduate student uh, underlings uh. back at the bench right now. But... So the basic idea is, since CRISPR originated as a bacterial immune system, so in essence a defense system against invading pathogens, and we are already repurposing it um, in terms of targeting sequences that we want to target, uh, the next step is to now genetically introduce the components of CRISPR. Um, in this case, it would be the Cas9 nuclease, the gene encoding it, if you put that into the genome of a mosquito, for example, uh, along with the appropriate guide RNAs and then whatever other payload you want. And so we have colleagues who are doing this in uh, mosquitoes that um, carry malaria. And what they do is they also, along with the Cas9 and the guide RNA, they uh, express genes that um, uh, express antibodies against the plasmodium, which is the malaria parasite. And so the key here is that when you put this whole package into the genome of the mosquito, and then, which they haven't done yet, but uh, they talk about doing, if you release it into the environment, this now becomes uh, something that is going to break the rules of Mendelian inheritance. So the one animal you release into the environment uh, will mate with a wild-type animal, uh, and normally that animal would have you know, a 50-50 chance of inheriting uh, the, the copy of this transgene that you put in. But the gene drive system actually will convert every heterozygous animal into a homozygous animal, meaning that within that lifespan, you will change the genome of the offspring of this mating so that they now have two copies of the transgene rather than a 50% chance of having one copy of the transgene. And so when you do this, the, the mathematical modelers tell us that this will drive the gene through the population. And something like an insect has a very quick life cycle, so it can be as quick as two or three weeks. And so if you were to start with a small release of, of these genetically modified animals, you could conceivably convert the genomes of the wild-type population in this area um, to carry the, the transgenes that you've introduced. And so the good, the, the promise of this is I think pretty obvious. Uh, you could potentially um, kill a certain species, so you could uh, express transgenes that uh, would essentially render the animals sterile, or you could have them express antibodies against plasmodium or against the viruses uh, uh, that they carry. And the risks are that it's a very hard thing to rein back in once, once you've released them into the environment. And you know we can talk 
there, there are potential risks to the ecosystem if we could achieve our goals of actually uh, locally extincting an entire species, which is uh, what some people would like to use this for. And we just, once you start pulling at those threads in the ecosystem, we don't know what other insects would come over to take over that niche. We don't know, you know, if these are the food source for um, various other insects. You know, you could have cascading effects that we don't completely understand. What do you think about the idea of sending another gene drive after the first one if something goes wrong? That's what George was talking yeah, about last yeah, night. And, and I mean, that sounds like a sci-fi movie uh, in, in the making. It, it, it really does. And, you know, I like to think of, you know, there have been these experiments, particularly in, in geographically isolated places like islands, you know, so there will be invasive species. So, you know, in the Galapagos, they have goats that people dropped off and now they're flying helicopters around shooting at the goats <laughs> and the helicopters because they're destroying native uh, uh, habitats for native animals. And Hawaii, you know, you had this, this kind of cascading, you know, release of, uh, of various invasive animals. Uh, Australia has done the same thing where you release one animal to, to predate <laughs> upon the first one that you released oh. to, to have a good effect. So I think if we don't fully understand the risks of the first gene drive, I would be very uncomfortable sending another gene right. drive after, after the first one, one after the, uh, to, so, to try and roll it back. But George did talk about releasing these into a contained sure. environment and now ask, is that, is that a Ab absolutely. prospect? Yeah, yeah. So I describe what he was talking about? Yeah, so uh, I think he used the, um, the word dome. So he envisions building a, a village that is isolated from the rest of the environment. Uh, uh, physically, uh, the kind of the built-in way to do that is to find an island somewhere. And, uh, you know, mosquitoes can fly, but they can't fly that far. So if it's isolated enough, you, you could... Hope. Yeah, that's no, true. <laughs> um, they can hop on boats. That's how they've made it all the way around the world. But the idea is that we will absolutely need to test this in some sort of isolated situation before. But I, I always get back to the idea that we can never fully model an ecosystem. Um, you, we can try, we can try our best, and we can right. try and show that this will be uh, effective, at least, and safe insofar as we can, uh, it, you know, assay the safety. But it is, there's, there's something uncomfortable about sending something out that you don't have a really easy way of, mm -hmm. of reining back. We've in. never had this kind of power before. Right. I guess that's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's true. So let's, let's get back to something a little less controversial, maybe... Uh, Manipula manipulating um, various organs um, that where we could help cure disease. So, Stephen, you're involved in retinal um, diseases. Is there a way that CRISPR could be used safely, you think? In yeah, so I, don't, I show the video. This is the results of the uh, first uh, retina human gene therapy trial. And now the data is, so this is, a, this is the optic nerve in the eye. So someone you can inject. Uh, viruses, delivery system, or uh, on the DNA. So this is, inject a big bubble in the retina. And this is a pre-op before surgery. Before get, uh, this is an adeno-associated virus, and most likely would be approved uh, sometime next year for the first gene therapy drug. This is the patient. The task is to go from one side to, to the other side of the room. Be this is before surgery. So the patient bump into a thing, and the time, how long does it take from this side of the room to go to the other side? This was a patient at Morfield's Eye Hospital in London. There's also about 30-something uh, patients in the U.S. is getting the same gene therapy virus. Mm -hmm. And th those data are currently being reviewed by FDA. This is a phase one trial. <coughs> so this patient is more advanced. In the phase three trial, some of the children were enrolled in the phase three. So the patient bump into the, into the wall get disoriented. So the task is to go from this side of the room to do the other side of the room. And they're being timed how long it takes. So sometimes they get disoriented. This is for a um, monogenic retina degeneration, a form of retinitis pigmentosa. And I'll show you how patients look like, with their, how they see the world with retinitis pigmentosa after this. So it takes a long time from this side of the room to go to the other side. Mm. In, in, uh, in Philadelphia, the effect, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the effect peaks around six months. In London, the effect peaks around uh, one year. So now, yeah, the same patient, a few months after surgery, so they, they finally take to the time how long it takes. So it takes about 77 seconds uh, from this side of the room to go to the other side. So now this is the same patient, uh, six months after surgery. 
from here, and then the same, same patient uh, from here to the other here. And this patient receives stem cells? Uh, gene therapy. Gene therapy, yes. delivered by injection yes. into, the, into the eye. In the eye. So this, the patient went through. So that's why most likely your tax dollar, Medicare, would cover <laughs> this. Uh, <laughs> and, and the price will be, after Jacob, we can discuss what thing of the price of gene therapy. And the reason that the, uh, the, there is uh, the CRISPR pharmaceuticals, at least I know two of them, they, they, uh, it's one of them will claim that uh, 2017 next year they will do the eye. Hmm. So, uh, part of the reason this is a blood vessel, and this is the only part in the human body, the only part in the central nervous system, you can count individual cells, they're individual light-sensing neurons, you can see them. It takes about 10 minutes to get this picture. So that's why the, all the CRISPR companies interested to do the eye. It's the same reason why the only embryonic stem cell trial in the U.S. is also done in the eye. And most of the gene therapy trials now is also done in the eye because you have two eyes, right? So you don't have two brains, you don't have two spinal cord or two heart. So there's already a control already. And then there's a, a hundred, more than a, hundred, a century of history of very sensitive psychophysical testing, almost at a single cell level. So ophthalmologists usually do not trust what, what patients tell them what they see, but you can actually test them objectively. And let's show you this imaging. So you can count the cell for gene therapy, CRISPR, or stem cell. You, need to, you can count the number of cells to see whether or not, yeah. Because for neurodegeneration, you're not likely to improve people, but you want to see if the number of cells uh, survive longer. So you can just count by counting. The, the surgery I just showed you earlier is outpatient procedure. It takes about one hour. So it's, uh, eye surgery is outpatient, much easier. Top, uh, topical, uh, local anesthesia. So local delivery, you can, and, and just making uh, uh, DNA or making vectors, making cells. You just need 10 to the 6 cells for stem cell transplantation. The production of cells, bioproduction is much easier. And not, maybe not so relevant for CRISPR for stem cell transplantation, the eye is immunoprivileged. So for cornea transplantation, we do not do any HLA matching. The, the eye ex express a lot of very high level of fast ligand. A lot of the T cells just uh, get killed. Next slide. So you can, these, are, these are the histological level. These are light sensing neurons. And most of the times in patients with retinitis pigmentosa, <laughs> macular degeneration. In macular degeneration, these epithelial cells died away. In retinitis pigmentosa, these kind of cells died away. And you can count the number of cells. And this is done in histology. I'll show you the next slide. This is done in histology, just in human uh, retina. And this is done in uh, yeah, live imaging in the same patient, it takes about less than five minutes to acquire. So you can almost get, get histological level in live people. Next slide. This, this is stem cell, or this is just returning uh, a gene in? Yeah, so in the eyes, uh, both embryonic stem cell transplant and re uh, gene, they call gene uh, supplementation, gene addition therapy. Not CRISPR. CRISPR has not been used. It's it? not approved by FDA yet, but they think 2017. Right. So the gene that was being corrected, can you say a word? How, how was the gene therapy being done? What was, what so, was so CRISPR is a, a game changer in a, in a sense that before we can only think about recessive conditions because we can only add a gene. Now, now CRISPR, in principle, you can either uh, uh, destroy a bad copy selectively of a dominant condition. So before... Before CRISPR, uh, gene therapy is directed mostly of uh, recessive conditions, has not been envisioned for dominant conditions. And the trial that you showed us, that was just a recessive, a recessive allele. It's, it's just a, so retinitis pigmentosa, these people get tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. they, they, they will pass the New York State and New Jersey driving test. <laughs> 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 that doesn't give us much. Maybe next slide, one more. Much yeah, the next slide. True. So then, the, then, of course, for, from a pharmaceutical point of view, is to uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa is just a test case, essentially for them. Macular degeneration, one third of the people in this room would get some form of macular degeneration by 75. Mm -hmm. So it's by, by the time macular degeneration now affects more than 10 million people, by 2020, the number of cases of macular degeneration would double. And probably that's the reason that they're going after currently monogenic disorder. And, uh, and the big prize, at least for in, in neurosciences, will be to cure, to uh, do CRISPR for macular degeneration. Right. Thank you. So we have a, a few more minutes before I'm going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. So I want uh, everybody thinking about their, their questions. Um, but Neville, I guess in the, on, in, on this day in which uh, Muhammad Ali passed away, uh, Parkinson's, um, 
was wondering if you could tell us, is there any likelihood that CRISPR technology might be used to replace dopamin dopaminergic neurons in, in this uh, disease? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really nice kind of inspiring thing to think about because it's, it's one of these diseases that's very difficult to, to treat. Mm -hmm. So I was going to take your human gene editing question in maybe a different direction because I think people mostly, sure. when you say human gene editing, you just, it just sounds kind of devious and evil in some way. And so I'll, I'll give you an example of something that we're doing in the lab in a neuroscience context, it's not Parkinson's, but it's a neuroscience context, mm -hmm. uh, that, that I, I think is personally like a very exciting direction with, with human gene editing. And so, um, as, as all of you probably know, that if we're interested in neurons and, and neuropsychiatric or neurodevelopmental diseases, it's very hard for us to go to patients and just take out these neurons and observe them. <laughs> that, nobody is gonna approve that, nobody is gonna allow that. Um, you just can't do that. And so, but you know, as neuroscientists, we really want to study uh, the, the cells that have the disease, the neurons. And so we have all these fancy techniques for kind of looking at it from the outside of the brain. And that's um, kind of at the end of the day, it can only be satisfying in a limiting way. And so one of the revolutions um, that's happened over the last 15 years also has been, we've kind of talked a little bit about embryonic stem cell technology, whether it's, uh, or plur I should say pluripotent stem cell technology, whether it's in a mouse context or a human context. And what the word pluripotent means, and the reason why everybody is excited is, is it means that this cell is capable of generating any other cell type um, that's, that's there in the body. And so when we think about cells like neurons, or we just can't go up to the patient and grab the neurons out, we can use uh, uh, stem cells, uh, pluripotent stem cells, to actually make neurons, even in a very quick time period. We do it in the lab in just one or two weeks. And we have these things that fire action potentials. They spike like neurons uh, do. They have these electrical depolarizations. And so how does this intersect with, with CRISPR? Let's try and, uh, I guess, bring mm -hmm. it back there, which is that one of the, the neurodevelopmental diseases that I'm very interested in is autism. And, and one of the reasons that I think everybody should be interested in autism right now is, one, the incidence rate is, is rising quite a bit. But the other thing is that due to genome sequencing techniques, we're, getting, um, we're doing a better job of characterizing the genetic differences between um, patients who have, uh, people who have autism and uh, what we might just call like a control <laughs> population. And, and my interest is more in the very severe forms of autism. There's like a constellation of, of symptoms that are not just uh, social disorders, but maybe also include like an IQ deficit, very severe forms. And so what we do is we sequence more and more people and this list of uh, different gene variants for all the 20,000 genes in the genome kind of grows and grows, the list that's associated with autism. And at the end of the day, as a scientist, it's not super, um, we're not convinced when we just say this might be associated with the disease because we're taught that correlation does not equal causation. So what we really want to do is say, does this gene cause the disease? And so one thing we can do in the lab is we can take these pluripotent stem cells, stick in the mutation if we have some easy way of putting in targeted <coughs> mutations. Uh, using either of the two pathways you talked about, the non-homologous end joining pathway, which is used for knockout, or homologous recombination, which is used for precise gene editing to put in a precise change. So we have this list of these changes that we observe in these patients. And uh, what we're now able to do, enabled by CRISPR, is we can put them in to these otherwise healthy stem cells, and we produce an identical twin stem cell, but this one just differs in one place from its twin. It has the mutation that we think might cause autism. And then we can differentiate these in the lab into neurons, this, this cool cell type that we just can't get any other way. And these are human neurons with a human genome, and so we can look at them at a molecular level, at a genetic level, at the level of neural networks when they're connected to each other. And this is just, uh, you know, I started uh, as a neuroscience PhD student a, a little while ago now, and this, I mean, if you came to me in, in my first year of grad school in 2001 and, and described the experiment that I just described to you, I, I would have, you know, I've just been like, this is impossible, this is, you know, many different things didn't exist. Maybe the, the stem cell technology, the ability to differentiate neurons, the ability to do quick uh, genome editing, and so, uh, this is really going to impact, it's kind of like what you said about the variance of unknown significance. We are great at, seek, at reading DNA, but not so good at writing DNA. And so as we read all this DNA, we find all these disease-associated variants. And I care about autism, but there are many diseases. You mm. can pick any disease, and this, you can use this as a general platform for generating disease-relevant cell types that we can then use to do drug screens, all these important things that we think at the end of the day are going to lead us to one, understand the disease, and two, develop therapeutics to address it. In a place like autism, we, we really have 
no therapeutics. So is that done with uh, ES cells or IPS cells? And maybe you can so explain so the you difference between the two. Yeah, yeah. So, so without getting too deep into yeah. the stem cell hole, since I'm, I'm <laughs> you know, I, I use stem cells, but I don't consider myself a stem cell biologist. So um, there are two kinds of stem cells commonly used, and uh, both in mice and in humans. And those, those stem cells are referred to as embryonic stem cells, which are isolated from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst, uh, early stage embryo, or, or the real, like, um, just amazing breakthrough that was recognized with the Nobel Prize uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, IPS cells. And this is, uh, if you think about it, there's a basic fact of biology you might have learned in high school that actually has wide-ranging implications that were only recently uh, realized, which is that all the cells in your body, whether they're neurons or liver cells or skin cells, they all have a complete copy of the instructions to make you. They all have the same 3 billion base pair genome. But why do the cells look so different? The liver cell, the hepatocyte makes fat, it does all this metabolic stuff. The brain cell thinks, why? You know, they all have the same genome, but, but they've evolved in, in different ways. And this kind of gives you hints at another question. Is it possible to interconvert, to do some kind of <coughs> cellular, cellular alchemy, to make like skin cells into neurons, or make neurons into liver cells? And um, it turns out, that only very recently we discovered that it's true. There's the same copy of the instructions of life in every cell, and you can, you can interconvert them. So there's um, work by, done by Yamanaka and colleagues that was recognized by a Nobel Prize uh, a few years ago now, where they show that they could take um, fully differentiated skin cells, fibroblasts, take a little sample, just kind of you know, scratch you a little bit, and uh, by expressing a certain set of genes, they could kind of kick the cell back into its pluripotent state to make it again that kind of cell that can make any other, any other cell type. And this is, again, it's obvious, right? All cells have the same full copy of the DNA, but uh, the fact that this was just only recently realized the true potential of it is, is uh, amazing. To and the real advantage mind. of this is that if you take a skin cell from a patient and you want to induce it to make another cell type and then replace that cell, it has the exact same histocompatibility, it won't be rejected by the patient because it has the exact same genetic... This, this actually brings up a really good point, if you don't mind me. No, 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 please. A little back and forth here, a little pushback. Yeah. So, so you might say, well, why do we need this genome editing? If you have this IPS, uh, this induced pluripotent stem cell, why don't we just collect all these autistic patients? We just get a little bit of skin from them. That's not so, so painful. And why don't we just go ahead and, and make <laughs> the neurons from those stem cells, right? That should be possible. You don't need CRISPR. And this is an approach many folks have pursued in the field, especially before CRISPR, um, and uh, it, a lot of productive science has come from it. But if you think about it, if you take a bunch of unrelated people who you've classified as having a disease like autism, um, they also have a totally different genetic backgrounds. Like our, even though maybe we're uh, normal in social behavior, and hopefully, uh, <laughs> you know, we look very different. We have a genetic back, we have a difference in genetic background. And so those can be, for a scientist, confounding factors. So the approach that I described to you is called isogenic uh, kind of stem cell disease modeling. And this to be, is to be contrasted with getting those iPS cells from a bunch of different people. Here what we can do is take one healthy stem cell, may, maybe, you know, from me or from you, uh, for iPS cell, and put in all these different autism, let's like say we have a list of 100 mutations that you, neither you or I have, but we can put these guys in, and then each cell is kind of an identical twin to the other cells, hopefully aside from just this one locus, this one genetic region uh, that, that we've modified. And so scientists really like this idea of a well-controlled, tightly controlled experiment, same genetic background. We love using identical twins a lot in genetic studies. Yeah. And so, um, so this, this shows you a key difference between just using iPS cell technology alone and adding on this, this genome engineering. And so um, my, I, just, I guess my encouragement to you overall is when you hear things about human gene editing, I really think about all the positive things that we can do at the bench um, kind of it, hopefully extend it to the clinic too. And really I think there's a lot of fun science fiction-y things um, that we can think about also that maybe aren't, um, to me, aren't as relevant because the stuff that's right in front of us I think is just gonna have a, such a tremendous impact on human health that no, nobody in this room, I can, certainly not me, can even predict where we're gonna be mm. five years from now in terms of therapy development and disease modeling ability, what I just told you about. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Stephen, you want to add a little bit to that? Yeah. So, so uh, what Neville mentioned now is now uh, when we had embryonic stem cells, the current embryonic stem cell trial in U.S. for for the retina is the people will be on immunosuppressant because embryonic stem cell does not come from the patient. Right. 
So the idea is to take your own skin cells, turn them into stem cells, and transplant them back to the retina. So this is being approached now. In Japan, they did one patient. But then it, 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 so this is uh, before monogenic disorder, some of retinitis pigmentosa. You still need to correct the, the mutation before go back to the same patient, or else the cell is just going to do, uh, degenerate again. So be, before gene editing as a whole, and, and CRISPR in particular, because of the ease of doing gene editing to correct, uh, gene repair, then it's now possible to envision that, that you can take the patient's skin, cor uh, turn them to stem cell, correct the mutation, and put it back in the same <coughs> patient. Mm. So the only, the only thing preventing from this, uh, doing that is the, the cost and the regulation. Mm. What about bone marrow? Couldn't you, for blood cell disorders, uh, couldn't you take it out, engineer it, put it back? That's There's several companies doing this. Yeah, yeah I think doing the, even yeah. free CRISPR yeah, can be done stuff. safely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it, then it, I think uh, prior to that, there were some companies here based in New York that were doing similar work, but with B cell limb lymphoma. So yes. I mean, it's you know part of a long lineage of experiments like this. There, there are folks working out uh, working on knocking out the receptor with previous things like zinc finger nucleases or tail right. nucleases. The receptor. The oh, CCR5. Yeah, CCR5. CCR5. CXCR4. Um, yeah. Great. So we have about 20 minutes left, and I should tell you that I can judge our success by the quality of the questions that come from people. <laughs> now, the pressure is on. Um, if there are any questions in the audience, please, now would be your opportunity. I think we have microphones that can come around, and ethical, scientific, or otherwise. Ah, there's one. Thank you. Uh, this is more of an ethical question, but um, in a world where CRISPR becomes more available to both scientists and everyday people, do you think that our future with CRISPR in it could suffer more from overregulation from governmental authorities or underregulation? Yeah. Um, so I mean, I'm, I'm happy to kind of step in first, Please and then do, we can yeah. have the rest of the panel think that I'm wrong, which is which <laughs> is fine. Um, so. I, I think when it comes to new therapies that are developed with the new technology, the historical trend has been <laughs> to regulate those, um, to, in other words, add on additional regulations that we didn't previously see to the current regulations that we have. So I, in my personal opinion, this, this, with some notable exceptions in the gene therapy area, especially in gene therapy circa the late 1990s, um, this hasn't really seemed to affect the progress of clinical trials that we're conducting here in the United States to develop these, uh, to develop some of the therapies using new technologies that we've had. So while the historical trend is kind of you know increasing incremental regulation for some of this stuff, um, I, I don't necessarily think it's been kind of you know it doesn't, hasn't really quashed a lot of the technology so far. Um, but that's not to say that the things are going to be different for CRISPR here. I can envision one world in which, our, uh, in which uh, people in Congress think, oh my god, this is you know, such a powerful technology, and you know, we're just going to kind of let anybody use it, and that's particularly uh, problematic. And so I could see Congress attaching a bunch of additional requirements to laboratories that receive federal funding to not engage in this type of research, much in the same way that we've done with stem cells. Or um, I can also envision a Congress that can't get their act together and does nothing at all, um, which no. is not that shocking to anybody <laughs> here, um, in, in, in which case, essentially, the status quo wins with, with respect to CRISPR is um, very lightly regulated, if it's regulated at all, depending upon what your definition of that is. Ellen, I, I'm, I'm sure that you have more thoughts on this. So I, I, I do, just because I just came back from two days in right, Washington. There's right. a National Academy of Sciences panel that has been tasked with that question, basically, is to think about these things that are going to come through the regulatory system within the next five or 10 years, and do we need more regulation? Um, obviously, there were a lot of corporate representatives there that were fighting for sort of the viewpoint that really this is no different in terms of the edits that we make. It's just we're making them faster, so it doesn't really require uh, a, a new level of regulation besides the, the regulation that we have now. Um, and then there were people uh, from other you know, viewpoints, uh, more sort of citizen groups that were sort of, it was a public meeting, by the way. It's, it's, uh, it was streamed live, and I think it's probably going to be uh, online somewhere at the National Academy of Sciences, if you're interested. 
But it, it, one of the reasons they brought me in is that I run the citizen science lab in Brooklyn, and I teach the general public to do CRISPR. So if you come and you take our class, you will be in the lab, you will be modifying yeast with CRISPR, we will teach you how to make the guide RNAs, and it's essentially um, just like a class that you would get in a school, uh, although I don't know if anyone's teaching CRISPR classes, <laughs> we're probably teaching classes before the schools are. It's something that you'd learn at the bench from your, from your PI. So uh, uh, right now, um, in the United <coughs> States, uh, genetic engineering outside of a conventional yeah. institution is not illegal. Um, in Europe, for example, you have to have a site license. In the United States, the only law that's sort of overarching is the Homeland Security Act that says it has to be done for useful and peaceful purposes. So what we find at GenSpace, because one of the things we are is sort of a pre-incubator space, uh, we have people that pay $100 a month to use our lab, which is a fully functioning molecular biology lab in Brooklyn, and a lot of them are starting companies. And a lot of them have uh, professional backgrounds or uh, are partnering with people that do and they have ideas. And the idea is, um, do you want to regulate away innovation by, uh, uh, for example, the, the companies that sell DNA are um, at this point being held to develop very strict guidelines on what sequences they sell. So, you know, well, they have to screen them. Uh, is this something that could be used as a weapon? Oncogenes, uh, things that cause cancer, they don't, they, they're, they're prevented from selling? Or? No, it's more like select agents, like I if at any part of the smallpox virus or anything I like see. that. And they have these very elaborate software things. But they're, they're actually pushing for um, those, they're right now, they're, they're voluntary guidelines, but they're pushing for them oh. to c become law because in essence that would give them a, no a monopoly on the DNA synthesis business because it's expensive to do that screening. And so if you're a small startup trying to make a DNA synthesis company, you couldn't compete with them. So there are a lot of very interesting hmm. uh, ins and outs. It's a very good question. Hmm. Other questions out there? Yeah, microphones. Um, so you mentioned before that uh, the CRISPR in comparison to older techniques is uh, a lot faster but a lot more cost effective, but um, didn't sort of lay out like how, mu how much would it actually cost to do like some experiments with CRISPR? Uh, CRISPR? It depends on the scale of, I, I mean, I'll, I'm sure many people can answer this here. It depends on the scale of the DNA synthesis to get back to DNA synthesis. Um, you know, at, at kind of the single plex level, um, you know, something that molecular biologists are very used to doing in the lab is buying short pieces of DNA to do something called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which is a way we uh, routinely amplify DNA since the late 1980s, um, just an in vitro reaction. And so the cost of those little DNA pieces that we use for PCR, is, it's pretty much the same thing, same size piece of DNA that's used to build a CRISPR um, <coughs> guide sequence. Uh, we, we mentioned that the protein component of the CRISPR system is generic and it's guided to its target by a little piece of nucleic acid. So to, just to give you an actual number, I mean, if you just like man off the street calls up IDT, Integrated DNA Technologies, and you ask for one of these to be shipped overnight, eight dollars, yeah. five dollars. Well, there it's are, 40 bucks when you add the shipping. Yeah, yeah, right. Both, okay. both, both Have strands. Have institute negotiate with IDT is yeah. what I really recommend. It's right. important. Oh, you probably get the but, institutional discount. Yeah, I think most, most universities try and, yeah. <laughs> But you still you have to grow the cells, and there are other yeah. expenses, so it, it's a little bit more. No, but it's that, uh, but it's on that scale. It, it's on that scale. Let me just jump in too, yeah. because yeah. it completely <laughs> depends on what you're trying to modify, right? So okay. we've gotten to the point now where in the mosquito, the the cost of the DNA synthesis and the reagents to actually do the CRISPR is negligible. You know, it's it's a it's drop the in the things. bucket. Yeah, we have to get these into the embryos of mosquitoes, so that involves microscopes and needles and we have to rear these animals, we have to feed them over time, we have to employ technicians to you know, keep the insect facility running. And so at this point, I would say there's nothing we could do to make CRISPR any cheaper that would bring down, that's not the rate limiting step for us anymore. Um, and that's kind of amazing because back when I started five years ago, the cost of a single zinc finger nuclease from Sigma was $25,000. Hmm. And so we've gone in used, five used years. To be more than that, actually. exactly. So, yeah. so as somebody really? who oh. just jumped into this game, I've already seen it come down orders of magnitude. And so, 
unless you're talking about genome-wide scale. So if you want to mutate 20,000 genes, mm. yeah, then it's, uh, it's going to add up. The, but, well, I was going to say the price is even cheaper because it's... Per gene. Because we do oligo-array synthesis. Yeah. So it's, it's a different scale yeah. of synthesis, and there it becomes right. pennies, basically. But as you said, the, the rate-limiting step, I don't think, is the DNA. It's the other aspects of just yeah. doing being in a biology lab. You need, yeah, grow the cells, cells grow the organisms. Yeah. How's the mice? I mean, how, yeah, you pay more, <laughs> more for mice than yeah. you do for CRISPR now. There but, is actually, and this yeah, is very controversial, mice. there is a uh, Indiegogo campaign right now that um, some guy who claims to be promoting citizen science is running, and I think it's $160, and you get some plates of yeast, um, you get a CRISPR-Cas9 plasmid that has a knockout, a specific guide <coughs> RNA that knocks out a gene in the adenine synthesis pathway, an intermediate will build up and the yeast will turn pink, so you'll know whether or not you've done it, and a couple yeah. of reagents to help you make the yeast uh, uptake the DNA, and um, some plates and some pipetters. Huh. For 160 bucks. So. Not bad. <laughs> but, but they, sort of easy bake crisper, I mean. It's <laughs> <laughs> but it's that it's a time. time. Time is the most expensive. So be, before, I mean, uh, for crisper, on Monday you have to you have a design or a guy, and Wednesday you're ready to inject. But when we talent, which is even the most nephew you uh, have to develop to make it easier to use, it takes about a month for, from conception to the talent is ready to assemble. And then before, what well, the same finger, if you design it, there's like an 80% failure rate. You pay a, a sigma, a single mode, $40,000, then there's a 90% success rate. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Oh, uh, we have a microphone, just if you can wait just a sec. Sorry. Thank you. I wonder if anyone on the panel can comment on the applications in agriculture and livestock farming and marine yeah. um, development. It's a good question. It was discussed heavily last night. Any of you guys feel like uh, tackling that or not well, my area? Well, the plant thing is, is really interesting. Um, did anyone see the news story about the mushroom that people are, uh, the GMO mushroom that people are upset about because it doesn't, um, it's not GMO according to the FDA? Mm. So they, if you use CRISPR to knock a gene out, um, the CRISPR, uh, there are ways that you can do it such that the CRISPR system doesn't stay in the organism. It's, it's, it, it the organism loses it because it, it, if you don't give it a selective advantage to keep it, it'll just lose it. Um, and so you make this break, the normal system comes in and tries to repair it, and now that repair job, if it's botched, can knock out a gene if it's that non-homologous end joining. And it's really, uh, you can't tell whether that was a natural, uh, a natural phenomenon or genetically modified. And um, apparently a lot of very uh, valuable um, uh, phenotypes in plants you can get to by knocking genes out. Mm -hmm. So uh, now you have a whole array of technology that you can use that doesn't really interact with the regulatory system right now because you're not putting foreign DNA in. Um, if you use a gene gun, then you're not using plant pathogens. And right. yeah. so. So, so uh, actually, the, the plant people are very, very excited very about Very excited CRISPR. about getting much more plants per acre and feeding a, a hungry world. And that was discussed uh, last mm -hmm. night. Yeah. Jake, you have yeah, so there's also the, the vector that's being used for some of these. So the thing that's actually transformed in some of these cases is not the plant itself. It's some of the bacteria that attach themselves around the root of the plant. Mm -hmm. So in the m mushroom that was recently approved, or I think that's definitely the wrong word, that was determined not to be under the regulatory authority of either the USDA or the FDA, the thing that was modified was this bacteria called uh, agrofascians, right? Oh, really? I didn't know it was yeah. the bacteria. I thought it was the mushroom. No, well, no, no, no. So what they do is they modify the agrofascians. This is work that's being done <laughs> at Penn State right now, and that attaches to the root of the shroom, and that's the thing where the sure. DNA from the bacteria itself is uptaken by the plant in that, in that uh, particular case. And the reason why this is important is it is much, much, much easier to do gene editing in, in bacteria than even things like plants. Um, so again, a lot of the agricultural scientists are just kind of over the moon at the possibilities here. Um, so, could, could somebody explain to me, is there any real rational reason to worry about GMOs? I mean, honestly, is there anything that we should really be concerned about in terms of what could potentially happen? We, we, we have done a fantastic natural experiment 
um, if you know, uh, for the past uh, almost 20 years, um, if you have eaten soy, period, um, <laughs> since about roughly 1997, you have eaten a GMO, and um, you know, in fact, if no you've eaten yogurt, evidence. you've also eaten bacteria yeah, sure. that have been defending themselves against viruses that would ruin the bacteria that are needed to make the yogurt for many, many years. So they're with CRISPR. With, with CRISPR. CRISPR. Yeah. <laughs> with CRISPR. Question, yeah. Uh, just back to the ethics again. Um, you know, as a layperson, I, I hear folks like you and, and lots of people talk about the dangers, the possible dangers in the germline research and the off-target effects mm -hmm. and so on. But I can't help thinking about communities like the Huntington's community, Tay-Sachs, CF, BRCA gene. What do you say to those people and how do you resist their pleas for help when something is out there that could knock these diseases out permanently, as I understand it? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very, very good question. It's an ethical question that we all have to struggle with. And, you know, physicians take an oath to do no harm. Yes, they want to do good, but at the same time, they can't, you cannot take the risk that there will be some worse debilitating disease downstream. Now, we might be able to get to, get to the point. It's not hopeless. We might be able to get to the point where the benefits will absolutely outweigh the risks. I personally just don't think we're there yet, quite frankly. And I understand, and I understand the passion, and I understand the plea, and I think it's an important, very important ethical issue, but one that both scientists and lay people have to struggle with for just that reason. Do you see what I mean? But, but we, sh we should say yeah. that for most of the diseases you mentioned, I, th I think there are NIH-funded and, and other scientists all over the world that are using a variety of tools, including genome ed editing, to, uh, to, to one, to create models of those diseases that they can easily handle in the lab, and then two, to, to, to they're actually are working, I mean, this is a product of all your, your tax dollars funding the N NIH, which is a very tiny portion of the budget. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be bigger, uh, but it's, um, you know, this is the, the great stuff that's, that's happening. So it's not like, I don't think there's, even though maybe, I don't know if any of us work on any of the diseases you mentioned, but, um, but there are a lot of people who, who do. To study, but not necessarily to introduce into the human germline at this point. Maybe not to introduce into the human germline, but, but certainly to, to think about therapeutic strategies. Like you talked about a lot of hematopoietic diseases. Anything in the blood system is quite easy because our blood system really renews itself quite quickly using the stem cells <laughs> that are in our bone marrow. And so you can think of um, a ex, you know, not editing anything inside people, but taking out some of these bone marrow cells maybe uh, correcting some mutation, right. and then offering some, something where, uh, like sickle cell anemia, horribly painful disease, where there's basically no treatment. We use the same treatment that's been, that was first uh, prescribed in like the 60s or 70s, and it's yeah. not, uh, for these people, it's, it's not. But a again, the, the question was germline therapy as opposed to yeah, somatic that's, cell therapy. That, that's that that a very clear line yeah. that has to be drawn. And it's an incredibly important question that many people are struggling with, and we need to struggle with, and we have to have these types of discussions to try to answer that question rationally and, and reasonably. But, but, but that, that ethical dynamic go away if you have a highly effective somatic gene therapy treatment for Huntington or a drug for Huntington, or, right? Yeah, well, the obviously, if, it's, if you're isolated to a particular cell type, yes, but if it's more disseminated, then it becomes much more difficult, right? But, but if there's a good somatic gene therapy delivery to the brain, right, then you don't need to worry about the germline. Potentially, yeah. Editing. Yes, another question. I, I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned uh, your work on uh, autism and the effects on autism and using iPSCs, and I just wondered if, if you, you all could say a little bit more about sort of where CRISPR combined with iPSCs is, is actually going to, say, in, in neuroscience in the next five or ten years, uh, potentially affect the ability for us to create new treatments. Because as you know, for autism and pretty much across a lot of neuroscience, you know, you take psychiatry, there haven't really been any fundamental improvements in, uh, you know, many, many decades. And it's, it's sort of shocking in, in a way when you think about it. So I, I just wondered if, if there's some with some of these complex disorders, some specifics of, of where you see the, the combination of CRISPR and iPSCs actually changing, uh, you know, screening and, and development of therapeutics. That's a great question. Yeah. Neville, you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I can start. I, I, first, I completely agree with you that, especially like kind of in, in neuroscience diseases, that it's been kind of abysmal, our progress. And I think a lot of drug companies, though now things are changing, but have exited kind of neuroscience therapies over the last 10, 10 15 years because the progress has been so poor. And so I think the, the very, um, 
The problem with, with as I see it, this is a very personal view, the reason why in cancer we've had, I think, quite nice progress in the last few years, and, and, and the pipeline looks pretty good in cancer, actually, for the next several years, is that the disease phenotypes are so clear in cancer. Does, it, does the cell die? Does it survive? Does it travel? Does it metastasize? Or does it stay, stay put? Does the tumor get bigger? Is the tumor resistant to the drug? These are like life and death kind of things. They're very easy. It's like presence, absence kind of tests. But in neuroscience, like the phenotypes tend to be very, very subtle. Like, you know, what is the, how, you know, we don't even know really what are the right cellular correlates of a lot of these social or psychiatric um, uh, deficits that we observe in the, in, the, in the patients. And so I think getting the right, understanding, because we think that a lot of these behaviors, this is the major principle of neuroscience, is these behaviors we observe in the people are caused by things happening in here at the cellular and molecular mm -hmm. level. And so the question then becomes how do we, create great models of what's happening. How do we understand what's happening at cellular and molecular level? And I think that is where CRISPR, I mean, we're just in early days here. Like, we're mm. talking about just a couple years right. after the scientific community started to disseminate 2012, these, I mean, these, three yeah, and a half December, years yeah, or whatever. Yeah. This is like the stone age of CRISPR, I guess is the right way to put it. <laughs> mm. But, you know, imagine um, once, once the neuroscientists have a little runway just to, to really move with these. I, I think the clearest um, answer to your question is that people will be able to create accurate models that they can then apply the whole wide array of, of molecular biology and, and cellular biology tools and assays that we've developed you know, over the last 100 years or something, but they just haven't been able, they don't have the relevant maybe uh, cell type with the relevant mutations or what they think is the putative uh, causal variant in there. And now we can just try out, uh, we, can, we can easily create these, whether it's in a mouse, um, or in, in, a, in a human cell in a dish very, very um, quickly. And so I think that is really going to fuel things like genome-wide screens, small molecule screens for drugs, things like that. Um, that's, that's, that's where Put I see Put this in, in a time scale. 65 years ago, we did not know what the genetic material was. We did not, we did not know what DNA was. I mean, the speed with which this is happening is, is really quite remarkable. Maybe one or two last questions. We have another minute or so. Uh, this is with Dr. Sang. Uh, question about RP, retinitis pigmentosa. If, uh, does CRISPR change how you would treat the disease or be able to cure the disease? So in, in, so we, we, uh, in, in the clinic, it depends on what is available by FDA, right? So, so in 2016, uh, we still, I mean, there's no uh, proven effective treatment for RP in 2016. But yeah, as in 2017, one of the CRISPR pharmaceuticals said that they would treat one form of the uh, RP. The, the RP is very heterogeneous. They, they are these 60 genes can cause RP, and then there's, there's probably another 60 genes we, we had still being identified. So, you, so you, in, in the long run, then you want it to be, well, there's nothing more better than precision medicine to treat the patient's uh, own specific mutation than, than say you're applying for CRISPR to deliver it in the, in the eye. But, but fortunately, most of the gene therapy companies, pharmaceutical and CRISPR pharmaceutical, they, they pick the eye as their target. But you still would have to find the specific mutated genes for that particular purpose. Right? Yeah, this is the most, uh, most uh, highest level of precision medicine, right? You need to know the mutation of that patient right. and then put, put the gene uh, repaired by CRISPR. Okay. But, it, but also, <coughs> I mean, just, just it, it, together to emphasize on uh, what Neville say also, they also bring together with the, the same as in autism. There's no, no disease that we, uh, we cannot treat in medicine if we understand the mechanisms. So you can also envision that, that CRISPR identify uh, a, a, a pathway or a target, then you may not need to know that specific gene. For example, CRISPR are being applied to the vascular and theta growth factor for wet form of macular degeneration. So instead of people getting antibody injection, $2,000 a month, some, pa some, uh, some patients have got 100 injections already, and maybe you can do CRISPR and do it once. Because the pathway for the vascular, for wet macular degeneration is quite understood as opposed to for uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Kate is signaling our time is up. I can tell from the questions we did our job well. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to the panel. Thanks.